All right. Well, this is Dr. Morton dictating or uh, recording the lecture for uh, digital systems design number 16. This is for Friday, October the 2nd. So let's um, jump right in here, and we'll we'll go ahead and uh, look at the syllabus. So here it is. Uh, we're here looking at uh, the uh, 2nd of October and we're supposed to be finishing up 5 but we're still in 4 so I, I need to kind of pick up the pace here a little bit today and and uh, I'll do that uh, and then uh, so I'm probably gonna uh, I, th I don't think we're gonna do the practicum uh, uh, or I may assign it but it won't take a class period because well we don't have class uh, so I'll just I'll just put that out on the board and we'll go ahead and have a I'll post a lecture for the seventh as well and then the following Monday so this Monday we'll, we'll cover five and uh, and then uh, hopefully cover five next week and maybe even get into six and then on the following Monday uh, uh, I'll review the uh, I'll review for the test one again uh, and uh, and then and then we'll do the uh, test one on the 12th of October so almost two weeks all right so anyway um, all right good so we'll we'll get rid of this so let's uh, let me shrink this down a little bit more uh, let's see and we'll just get into it here uh, sorry there we go Okay, and then let me bring this back up and shrink it over here. So this is where we finished up last week. I'll move this just a little bit more. Okay. All right. So we finished up here, uh, and we were talking about uh, the BCD adder. Now, again, this is a little bit of a legacy thing, but it still has use, and especially in FPGAs, if you just need to do a little bit of math then uh, this might be uh, this might be a good way to go. Still, uh, if you have to do complicated math, then obviously you you, you want to probably just focus on um, doing it in binary. So that's that's. But we're going to go through this because it's a really nice exercise in uh, in, in the logic design part of this and and in in how you develop this. Okay, so. Uh, if you remember, we covered this where we where we we basically have to do um, we have to take whenever we exceed nine in a in our in a four bit result in a nibble, then we have to add six so that so that if we get a value ten, what we really want is a one added to the next nibble, and the, that nibble zeroed out. So basically, we just add six. That's kind of how we do it. All right, so how does this work out? And here's here's some of the math. So uh, six plus eight equals fourteen. Here's the binary. Six plus eight equals one 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 zero. Well, fourteen isn't a legal BCD number, so we have to adjust it. We add six. When you add six to this, there's six plus that. What do you get? You get one zero one zero zero, which is uh, one four fourteen. So that's correct. Okay. So whenever your sum in a nibble exceeds nine, you add six, and you make sure you do the carry to the next nibble. All right. So let's look at how this would be set up. Uh, we have uh, we have a four-bit adder here, which takes care of adding two nibbles to generate a four-bit or a nibble result plus a carry out. But we have to check that nibble. If it's over nine, we add six. Okay. And then here we are. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, we now have a uh, four-bit adder here to add the first two nibbles, and another four-bit adder here to add the second two nibbles. So what we're adding then is two, uh, two, uh, two-digit two, two-digit BCD numbers to get a three-digit result. Okay, and here's the problem. 38 plus 97 equals DF, but then we have to adjust the F by adding 6, and that gives us 5 plus a 1 over here, and now now we add the D to that, and that gives us 3 plus a 1 carried over here. 
So we wind up with 135, which is uh, the right answer. Okay, so <clears throat> this is what this looks like. And notice this is uh, the, uh, so we have this marked off. Uh, there are four, four lines coming out here, four lines coming out here, five lines coming out here because you have the four bits plus the carry out. And then we do an additional uh, add here. If our output, if the SO is uh, is greater than nine, okay. So <clears throat> hopefully that makes some sense. All right. So here's what it looks like in uh, our BCD code, uh, our our Verilog code for the BCD adder. So we're we're using tick to find, uh, and we're creating these variables. And then we're creating this module. Um, so digit 1 is x7 through 4, and digit 0 is x3 through 0. So these are just uh, what we basically defined is x is 8 bits, y is 8 bits, and z is uh, uh, 12 bits, uh, which is three 4 bit BCD digits, okay? So that's why 12. Two digits, two digits, three digits, where a digit is four bits. But again, because we have the six unused combinations, we have to adjust. All right, and we're defining the parts of these vectors as dig x, x1 and x0, y1 and y0, and then d2, 1, 0. So 2 is the upper, forward nib upper nibble, middle nibble, bottom nibble. All right. Uh, Hopefully that makes sense. And then we have some uh, some signals that we have to pass uh, around. Uh, our sum out of the first adder, our first four bit adder, the sum out of the next four bit adder, and a carry between them. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> and and note these are five these are five bit signals. They they have four bits of sum and a carry bit. They're five bits. Okay. And then uh, S0 is basically just X digit plus Y digit. So, so we're just basically, uh, we're adding these two. So here's our adder. Now notice to do this adder, we didn't, uh, we didn't instantiate uh, the gate level description of this adder. We, we did that as a higher level. We just used two vectors defined by these defined statements. So basically this is... Uh, uh, x uh, dig 0, which is x3 through 0, plus x7 through 4. We're adding these two nibbles. Uh, and then we, uh, we have another assigned statement, but we're using the question mark colon construct here. We test to see if <coughs> the sum out <coughs> is greater than 9. If it is, then, then we have to uh, add 6. And if it's not, then we don't have to do that add. All right. And then the carry out, uh, if S is greater than 9, uh, is a 1. Otherwise, it's a 0. And that's pretty straightforward. OK. And then for our second addition, we're adding, uh, the, we're adding the, 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 the second nibbles for x and y plus the carry bit that came out of the first edition if there was any if there were any it could be one or it could be zero and that gives us our sum one then we test that for greater than nine and if it is we adjust by six and if it isn't we don't and then uh, we assign then to the second digit um, well we assign to the first digit uh, the sum here and then to the second digit we assign uh, if S1 is greater than 9, then we assign that to be a 1. Or sorry, this is the third digit. Uh, the first digit's here, first nibble there, Z, Z, uh, dig 0, Z, dig 1, Z, dig 2. So our three digit output, our low order digit, our, net, our middle digit, and our high order digit. Our high order digit is only going to be a 1 or a 0. And then we're done. <clears throat> okay. All right, so um, 
Now, one of the things, one of the things to bear in mind, uh, for these to be uh, le le legitimate BCD digits, the uh, our initial values uh, must be legitimate uh, BCD in legitimate BCD format. So all the nibbles have to be nine or less. Otherwise, it, it, this won't work. Well, I, I don't know. I don't think it'll work. I, maybe it would, but I don't think so. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But remember, this is where we have the, uh, this description of we, uh, we're, we're going to build a, a state graph for the control circuit. So we have a data path and a control path. This is back to that same adder thing we did before. Uh, I'm uh, so uh, okay. So anyway, so our inputs here. Um, okay, L let me just hang on. Let me just. Okay, so we're leaving the BCD adder now, and we're going on to another topic. I, I got a little confused here for a second. So the new topic is state graphs or controlled circuits. Now we've covered this in logic design. Uh, but this is just a, a little bit different way of looking at it. And the point that they're trying to make here is that, uh, let's say we have a circuit here. Uh, this is our state graph, okay? And unfortunately, I don't know why, why you can't see it. And I don't know why that, oh, I see. There you, now you can. Okay. And then, can you still see it? Oh, I see. When I put my face, face in, you can't see it. Okay, that's fine. So anyway because it brings in the border. All right, so down here is our state graph. Now notice we have three nodes, or three states, S, K, S, P, and S, Q. I have no idea why they labeled them with such crazy labels. But in any event, um, if we're in, we start in S, K, now we have two inputs in this problem, X1 and X2. Now I want you to look at this. What do you, what do you notice about this state graph? What you notice is that if, if x1 and x2 are both 0, we stay in sk. If x1 is 1, we go to sp. And if x2 is 1, we go to sq. Now, what, what is the problem with this state graph? Well, the problem is that what if what if x1 and x2 are both 1? That's that's going to be a little bit of a problem, right? Because then uh, <clears throat> then which where do we go? SP or SQ? So uh, now in this circuit, Okay, so what this is showing us is the notation, and uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, we have x i x j, and uh, those are our two inputs. If those are one, if those are both one, then then z p and z q are both one, and all the other outputs are zero. Okay, so here's another example. Uh, so that's how you're supposed to read this. If x1 and xj are anything but 1, then this doesn't apply. How about a circuit with four inputs? x1, 2, 3, 4, and four outputs, z1, 2, 3, 4. So if you have z1, uh, sorry, x1, x4 prime, z2, z3, that means that if x1 is 1 and x4 is 0, then our output is uh, z1 is 0, z2 is 1, z3 is 1, and z4 is 0. That's what this means. All right, so with that in mind, if you look at this graph, if they're both, if both x1 and x2 are 0, we stay in sk. If x1 is 1, we go to sp. If x2 is 1, we go to sq. But what we haven't specified is what happens if they're both 1. Okay, so uh, uh, and, and why do these have to be don't cares? Because we always we always assume if you don't specify your output z, then then uh, if it's not specified, it's assumed to be zero. So these aren't don't cares; these are zeros. Okay, so we need a we need a completely specified state diagram, 
And if our state diagram isn't completely specified, then that, that can cause problems. So only one edge should be active. But if you have both, uh, if both uh, I1 and I2 are active, then, um, then, then you have to say, okay, then, then you're not going to either one if P doesn't equal Q. Okay, so the edges leaving the state have to sum to one. Uh, all right, so here's a completely specified diagram. If you're in SK and you get the input X1 is true, you stay here. If X1 is false and X2 is false, you go here. If X1 is false and X2 is true, you stay here. So if X1 is true, regardless of what X2 is, you're going to stay in this, in this case here. So to completely specify it, uh, what we're saying is that X2 doesn't matter if X1 is, uh, if X1 is true. So let me see if I can explain that a little better. I, I think this is somewhat confusing. Um, okay, I'm going to add this back. I'm going to expand it and I'm going to switch cameras. In. Okay, and then before I do this, I'm going to shrink this down. So we'll go over here. So before I do this, I'm gonna I'm gonna shrink this and I'm gonna copy this. So um, SK, SP, SQ, and then this is X1. We're gonna do this, and then X1 prime x2 prime x1 prime x2 okay <clears throat> now let me put the camera back on okay so and let's see where we are here all right so here's our here's our diagram now now what we're what we're basically saying is this, this this is completely specified. Why is it completely specified? Well, what what this really is up here, this this x1 <clears throat> equals x1 x2 prime plus x1 x2, and obviously we can combine these to x1. So by writing x1, we're including both of these possibilities, and then these possibilities then down here. Are, are split apart because uh, we 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 uh, we have to specify that x1 isn't not true here. All right. Um, so I mean, if you if you just wrote this <clears throat> x2 prime and x2, then how would you know where to go uh, when both x1 and x2 are true. All right, so so we need to have we need to completely specify the state diagram. All right, I'm gonna switch this back down. All right. So example, if we have a partial state diagram here, uh, so notice here, if they're both false, we stay here. If x1 is true, we go there. If x2 is true, we go there. But what do we do if x1 equals x2 equals 1? It can never happen. That has to be a, that has to be uh, that has to be a, a condition because if it does happen, then we won't be able to navigate this diagram. So if you have three input variables x1, x2, x3, um, here's your partial state graph. So sk. So if if it's 0, 0, 0, you stay there. If it's 0, 0, 1, you stay in SK. So that would be X1, X2. If uh, X, uh, X2 is a 1, then you're going to go to SQ. If X2 
2 is a 1 and x3 is a 1, you're still going s to q. Uh, so either way, if x if x1 is a 1, you're going to sp, regardless of what x3 is. But if both x1 and x2 are 1s, then uh, we don't we don't we don't have a uh, specification. So these are these are disallowed states. Okay. Okay. So one of the things, uh, another example here is a single pulsar. Uh, this is uh, this comes up all the time, and uh, so we'll talk about it. Let me let me switch this back. Okay, this is basically a debouncing circuit, and you know that that all mechanical switches, when contacts close, uh, usually do not generate a single step, either from zero to one or one to zero. They usually close and then open, close and open, and finally close because there's a little bit of bouncing on the contacts when they first meet, and that bouncing is pretty fast. It's in the millisecond range, or, or maybe even uh, tenths of a millisecond. So because of that, uh, you you if you only want a single button push to be recorded, then you you have to put in a, a little time delay to prevent those additional uh, bounces from counting as as as, as pushes. And uh, so the other thing, sometimes you want to just send. Uh, sometimes you just want to send a single pulse. When a button's pushed, that's maybe you know 10 milliseconds wide, and uh, and you don't want the you don't want uh, the high condition to just persist forever and and to continue to you know count for multiple pushes. So in that case, you just want a pulse to be generated. So uh, so here's a pulsar circuit that converts the human action to a single clock cycle pulse. Okay, so it's a two state. Uh, to state device, state S0 and state S1. State S0 is that we're, we're not indicating a pulse, and state S1 is we are indicating a pulse. We're generating that pulse. Um, so, and then we have sync press. That's our synchronized press. And uh, if there's no press, then we stay in our state S0. But if there is a press, then we send out the single, we, we make the single pulse true. And then as long as uh, the single press continues to be true, we stay in state 1. When it's no longer true, we default back to state S0. And then we wait there until the next press. And with the next press, we send out another SP pulse. <clears throat> so here's what this looks like. Uh, we have we have to have this synchronizing circuit that uh, allows uh, us to uh, to uh, synchronize our press with the clock, and this is where we get the little delay and we and we avoid the bouncing so that you don't send multiple presses. Then here's the uh, here's sync press output. So now we've now we've determined yes there's a push button, and uh, what happens then is the flip flop. The flip flop then uh, will uh, when is also synchronized with the clock. So the the D will be promulgated through, and this will become uh, not true. Whereas it was true before, and this 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 line. So what you what you get from this gate then is uh, the gate's normally going to be uh, normally it's going to be the case that that the flip flop is uh, is uh, that Q1 is true, but sync press is false. So when sync press becomes true, now they're both true. So you can send out a little pulse from this AND gate, but with the next clock pulse, the D flip flop is going to flip. Q prime is going to become zero. The AND gate will turn back off, 
And so that's going to generate your little pulse. All right, so this is a good good little circuit to kind of store away in your mind. And it, and it basically works because the clock is going to delay Q prime from going high, I mean going low, and shutting off the AND gate. The AND gate is normally off because sync press is normally not true. But when sync press is true, before the next clock edge, then the AND gate is going gonna, is gonna to output uh, a short pulse. And then when the clock strikes again, it's going to clear Q prime uh, and it's going to turn this gate back off. Meanwhile, sync press will go back to being false. All right, multiplier. This is really what I wanted to talk about in this unit. This, this is really the, uh, the I think, the the real takeaway info. Um, so this is an add and shift multiplier. Now uh, this is similar to the circuit we looked at in, uh, in uh, logic design, uh, but now we're going to look at actually what it looks like in Verilog. Okay, so, so there are really two parts there. First, we're going to go through um, uh, a little bit. We're going to revisit that uh, the multiplier that we looked at in logic design, where we did the add and shift. Uh, but then we're going to look at an array multiplier, and that's really what I want to get to do. So I'm going to go through this pretty quick. I, I, don't, I don't see the real value of uh, spending a lot of time on this. As you know, uh, multiplication in binary, uh, all we have to do is look at the 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 digits of the multiplier one at a time and if the the we take the first digit if it's a one we just copy the multiple can and then we shift uh, look at the next digit if it's a if it's a one we copy the multiple can again if it's a zero we just put zeros in and we keep going until we have all the partial products generated and then uh, we can also we can line up all the partial products and then add them at the end or we can add them as we go and uh, the the adder that we're going to look at adds them as we go okay so anyway uh, so here we're multiplying 13 times 11 we get 143 and the first two partial products 1 1 so we we get 1 1 0 1 and then we write it again but shifted left ones now we add these and we get 1 0 0 1 1 1 our next one, uh, so this is our first position, second position. So our third position lines up here. It's hard to see because this is slightly misaligned. And uh, and then you add that and you get one, one, one. Well, you get the same thing because this adds nothing. And then the next one lines up here. Yeah. And then we add this and boom, there's our answer. Now, let's... let's uh, so we'll go through this pretty quickly. We need a 4-bit adder, a 4-bit multiple can, a 4-bit multiplier, and an 8-bit product register. Okay, so uh, we normally separate our data path and our controller path. So our data path here is our, our add ends, or our, our multiplier, multiple can, and a product, and obviously our partial products. And here are the control signals. The control signals look at the multiplier digit and decide whether you're going to add and shift or just shift. And then, um, so again, this circuit, uh, I, I don't really like this because uh, th there's all sorts of features not explained. Like, for instance, these are bi-directional data paths. And how do we determine uh, w what's controlling which direction the path is working in? Um, and how do these, how do these paths uh, provide the input to the adder and then latch in the sum uh, on the same data path? How does that work? None of that's explained. So it's a little... So this is purely kind of high-level conceptual. But the idea is we, we have the multiple can here, and, uh, and we're either going to add the multiple can or we're not. And uh, if we don't add it, uh, whether we add it or don't, we always shift. Here's where we do the shifting in this shift register up here. We load the multiplier in the lower four digits, and we shift lower four bits, and we shift one, two, three, four times. And then what we're left with then in this nine uh, bit register <clears throat> is our final product. And this, this four bit adder uh, uh, does all the addition for us. 
because at any given time, the most we're ever adding is four, blit, four bits of the multiple can to our a growing partial product. But we have to shift the partial product so we're adding the multiple can to the right place. And we do it by using the shift register and shifting the, the partial product that way. We do it four times and we're done. And we use the last digit of the multiplier. We put the multiplier here, the multiple can there, and then we form the product in this register. And as we shift, we're slowly shifting out the multiplier digits and the, the current digit of interest will be in this zero bit position. If it's a, if it's a, this feeds into the controller, if it's a one, then we add and then shift, it's a zero, we just shift. We start the process by uh, a start signal which is issues a load command to get everything set up. And then uh, when we're finished, we do a done command. All right, and I'm not gonna go through this. Here, you've seen this graph before. We, we either, we, either we, we, we get a start signal, so we stay here until we get to start. Start signal, we load. And then after we load, we look at the first multiplier digit. If it's a zero, then we just shift and go here. If it's a one, we add and then shift. And we do the, now we have the next digit because the first digit's been shifted out and we've and added the first partial product to the shift register. Then we've shifted it. Uh, we check the next multiplier digit. If it's a zero, we just shift. If it's a one, we add and then shift. And we keep going all the way around until we've done four times. One, two, three, four. And then we issue the done command and we're back to the start. All right. So here's... Here's how this looks. Um, the very log part actually can make some sense. Uh, so we have to initialize everything. Um, we zero out the, the shift register, and then we put the, pro the multiplier down there. Uh, and we do that in the lower three bits, three through zero. That's the multiplier. And then, uh, and then we have this case statement where we're going, the case zero is the start, and then we do one, three, five, and seven uh, is the, if that's if m uh, equals a one, and that's the multiplier digit, the current multiplier digit. Uh, and then on the other hand, if, uh, it, if the uh, multiplier digit is a zero, then we just shift. So we only do this if the multiplier digit is a one. We always do this. And this, these are states two, four, six, and eight. So basically we do state one, then two, then three, then four, then five, then six, then seven, then eight, and we're done. And uh, so that's what this looks like. And that's actually, that works quite well. The other thing they do, they also do is uh, uh, we can, we can do this counter thing. This is the same thing they did. We notice that four of these are the same, so we just repeat them, but we already did that here because we just uh, doubled up these states, and that's, that's really, a, that, that, there's nothing inefficient about this. So, all right, and so we have, uh, now we have a, uh, an internal counter, and we just do the same thing. And this counter, we call it K, and when the counter, uh, counts 0, 1, 2, 3, counts four times, then we issue the done signal and we're done. That's all. But our Verilog code doesn't need that. Uh, it, 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 it's just as efficient without it because we, we reuse this, the cases. All right, <clears throat> this, is, this, is, this is important. So I really want to go over this so you understand it. This is, this is what an array multiplier looks like. Uh, and uh, and array multipliers are, are super important. And what they do, they basically have the logic to take uh, four bits of multiple can, in this case, four bits of multiplier, and generate eight bits of product. Now, how do they do that? Well, so you can see we have, this is an AND function here. So we take x0 and y0 and we AND them together. And we take x1 and y1 and and them together, and so forth. This generates that first partial product. And then uh, our next partial product is generated this way. And then we, but we have first row carries that we have to add in. And then we get the first row sums. 
Then we have the next partial product, the second row carries, the second row sums, the third partial product, third row carries, third row sums, and the final product by carrying all these things down. All right, so let's see what this looks like in hardware. So uh, in hardware, we, we have a bunch of AND gates generating these terms here, but we also have to have, uh, in, in this case, we don't have a full adder, we just have a half adder because there's no carry in for this first stage. But the rest of these are full adders. We can use a half adder here and a half adder there. So these full adders take the carry out from here. It takes the, the, the Y2 and it was Y0 from this AND gate. The, y1, the X1 ended with X1 from this AND gate. So it takes those three bits in, generates a sum, and a carry out. And, uh, and this is how it hooks all together. Now here's, here's the thing. As you look at this, as you look at this uh, diagram, what I want you to pay attention to is what, what's the critical path? By that I mean what's the worst case amount of time it's going to take to get through uh, this array and generate the product. Now notice this product is immediately generated by just anding x0 and x y0. So that's that digit comes out extremely fast in one uh, one AND gate propagation delay. What about um, <clears throat> this one? Well, this has uh, one AND gate for this bit, an AND gate for this bit. So basically, we have to go through one AND gate and then one half adder. And then, but what's the worst case? Well, P7 is going to be the worst case digit. And to get there, we, we start, say, with x1, y0. We go through an AND gate, a half adder, <clears throat> a full adder, a full adder, a, f a half adder, a full adder, a full adder. So we're going to have, so if we count the half adders and the full adders as the same, um, we're same propagation delays, we're going to have a one AND gate propagation delay plus one, two, three, four, five, six adders delays. So we have the delay through six adders and one AND gate. All right, so, so if we count all these up, we have 16 AND gates, eight full adders, four half adders. So that's what it takes for a four by four multiplier. And the time delay, uh, they're the half adders. And then our, the rest of the adders are full adders. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And our critical path then is eight uh, delay times through an adder and plus one delay time through, a, through the AND gate. So eight, eight add delays plus uh, an AND delay. All right. And here's what it looks like. We can do the Verilog code for this. So we start with four bits of X, four bits of Y, and we're going to generate eight bits of P. All right. And so here we are. Uh, so four bits of X, four bits of Y, eight bits of P. And then we have all these internal signals we need. And then here are our sign statements. Now notice, these are just these are just th these are these are just simple assign statements. There's no, just like the adder, this is a combinational device. There's no clock necessarily, uh, and it just it 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 takes a little bit of time to basically. We do have to ripple the carry through a little bit, uh, the carry outs from other digits, and uh, after after we have the delay of uh, eight adder gates and one AND gate, we should have a result. And then here's our full adders. So here's a, these, are, these generate all the AND gates. And here this generates all the half and full adder outputs. So we're instantiating uh, eight full adders, four half adders, and 16 AND gates. And there's your final product. Now compare that with just saying, you know, x times y, uh, that p equals x times y. 
But, uh, but with bit vectors, you're not allowed to do that. You have to make them integers. All right, so now we're going to talk briefly about signed integer and fractional multiplier. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not going to, I just want you to see that this is complicated. I don't think, uh, I don't think anybody, well, yeah, I guess we do implement them this way. But I want you to see that how, how to do this twos complement multiplication, how, how, how complicated it really is. Okay, so uh, if the multiplier is negative, you have to complement it. If the multiple can is negative, you have to complement it. So that you're basically multiplying by two, two positive binary numbers. Okay. Conceptually, this is more straightforward, but it takes more hardware than other ways of doing it. So, uh, and, and remember these signed fraction, fractional representations, they're, they're sort of complicated too. Uh, they vary from minus one to, to one. Um, and so in this case, we're going to have a three bit fraction with a, a zero, zero bit integer. Okay, so no integer portion. So the largest positive number is going to be 0.111. And because we're doing this in two's complement, you have to have this upper digit that, that's, a, that's a one, uh, which means it's negative. Uh, and so the, the largest positive number is that. And um, the largest negative number, minus one, then would equal this, 1.000. Okay, so, uh, so here's your... Uh, so if you have positive 5 eighths, it's going to look like this. If you have negative 5 eighths, it's going to look like this. And again, remember, you have to have this upper 1 to make it negative. Okay, so what I want you to see here uh, is, the, is, is that we have this... Uh, okay, so we have this fractional portion, but, but you have this, this 1's place here. Um, the you have to have this so that the number results to positive or negative, but you can't have it on this side of the decimal point because it screws up the fractional portion. I don't know, it's kind of confusing. Anyway, so if you take uh, so for if we multiply 0.625 by 2, uh, anyway. I, I don't know. This this is this is so painful. Um, so let me see. So you can see if we multiply 0.625 by two, we get 1.25. Um, and so if we multiply 0.25 by two, we get 0.5. If we multiply 0.5 by two, we get one. So that that works. Okay. Um, All right, and then it, this uh, 0.5, or well, yeah, uh, no, uh, 0.625 it, positive is 0 0.101, but in two's, in two's complement, negative 5 eighths is 1.011. All right. <clears throat> so now if we, if we add in now a... Uh, uh, Four bits of integer and four bit four fractional portions. So we have an eight bit uh, fixed point fractional number. Um, so this goes if it's unsigned, we can represent zero to fifteen point nine three seven five. If we do uh, if we do six bits for integer and two bits for a fraction, then we can go from zero to sixty three point seven five. Okay. Uh, and again, I, I don't want you to just just kind of look at this. Don't don't. I'm not going to test you on these kinds of things. Uh, I want you just to sort of understand the complications involved in this in this math. So converting the decimal fraction to a binary fraction. <clears throat> so if you remember, we have to do the integer portion and the fractional portion separately. We multiply the decimal fra decimal fraction by two. Uh, uh, starting after the decimal point and 
and then if the bit position after the decimal point is a one, then we put a one. If it's zero, then we put a zero. Um, so 13.45 then turns into 1101. That's 13. That's easy. And then the 45 is 0 0.0111. And uh, it there it may not it may it it is not necessarily a terminating fraction although I think in this case it may be I don't know okay so yeah so it's actually fixed point four point four is what it comes out to be it has to be rounded all right so negative numbers so first we convert the unsigned and then we take the two's complement so minus thirteen point four five we then we would take the two's complement uh, but it's not going to fit. Uh, so we have to add a sine bit right there uh, and because uh, this is if we didn't have a zero for a sine bit it would it, it'd screw everything up so anyway we have to add a zero and then we take the inverse because it won't fit in nine eight bits it, it has to be in nine bits so uh, so one zero zero one zero point one zero zero one. That's nineteen minus thirteen point four three seven five, uh, which sort of rounds up to four point four. All right. Precision always depends on the number of bits. Um, okay. Uh, so when you do signed binary multiplication, you have to think of four different cases. Uh, you have to consider the multiplicand and the multiplier both positive. You have to consider the multiplicand negative and the multiplier positive. You have to consider the multiplicand positive and the multiplier negative and the, both negative. All right, now again, I'm not going to test you on this. I just want you to see the complications involved here. All right, so uh, multipl positive multiplicand, positive multiplier. So basically, you have to sign extend partial products to multiply multiplicand sign. So you see the sign extensions here. Proper representation of fractional partial products requires extension of sign bit past the binary point, although you don't have to do that in hardware. And then the uh, if you're going to multiply can positive multiplier negative, now what you have to do, sign extend the partial products to multiple multiple can sign. All right, so you still do sign extend to the multiple multiple can sign. This is the multiplier, that's the multiple can. So multiplier, multiple can, sign extended, sign extended, and we get this. All right, now if you have multiple can negative, multiplier negative, sign extend partial products to multiple can sign. So now you have to sign extend with ones here, and then, uh, and then, uh, so, uh, did I miss something? Uh, oh yeah, multiple can negative, multiplier negative, and you still sign extend partial products to multiple can sign. All right. So multiplying signed twos complement binary fractions. You same as for positive numbers, except preserve the multiple multiple can sign for partial products. Sign extended appropriately. If the multiplier is negative, add complement of multiple can in the final step. All right. So that's what you have to do. Uh, so there's four different cases, and you have to, and they're all. You have to, you have to know whether the multiple can is positive or negative, and whether the multiplier is positive or negative, and you, and that generates four different ways that you have to do it. Uh, you always preserve the multiple can sign, but obviously for negative it's going to be a one extended, and for positives it's going to be zero extended, and then if the multiplier is also negative, then you have to add a complement of the multiple can in the final step. Uh, so the hardware for positive and negative multiplication it differs by one's camp one one's complement from the multiple can. All right, so I, again, not going to test you on this. Just want you to look at it. So if you think about this shift adder, uh, you have this uh, this uh, this CM number that comes in, and you have and and then you have to have a one's complementer here. 
in the CM if M equals 1 at the final step. You have to add a complement of the multiple can. And you have a 1's complementer, and then you add the, the 1 in here, and that gives you the 2's complement, basically. And uh, that's because you, you can have the carry out. Uh, that's, well, sorry, that's the sign extended, yes. All right. All right, otherwise the rest of it's the same. Uh, I'm not going to go into this, and I really don't care. Uh, okay. It has the... Uh, let's see, three bit multiplier. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think we're going to go into this. Um, so here's a, here's a three by three multiplier two's complement. Uh, so, uh, okay. Now the divider, I, yeah, I, I want to skip through this because, um, it's, Sort of, a, it's sort of beyond the scope, really, of of, of what we're covering here. Uh, I, I would I would like you to read through in the textbook and see if you can make sense out of this. I mostly want you to sort of see uh, that it's pretty complicated to, to write these mathematical units. Um, so, uh, <coughs> I'm I'm really going to kind of leave division. You know. So unsigned division is not too bad, but when we get into signed division, it's also a little crazy. All right. So as you know, you just see if you can subtract the divisor from the dividend. If you can't, you shift it and put a zero up. So the first one zero 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 is smaller than one one zero one. So you would put a zero up here for that. This is a little bit not registered perfectly correct, and then you shift it over. Now you can subtract 1101 from 10000. So you put up a 1, and there's the remainder. And then you bring down the next one, and you compare. It's smaller, so you have to shift one more. So you bring down one more one, and there it is. You subtract it, you get this. And then uh, that's uh, it's smaller, so that's your remainder. Cause, and you put up a 0. Okay, so unsigned divider. Uh, so the same thing, uh, and, and we they have this parallel binary divider. Uh, we're not going to go over this. I didn't cover this in logic design, and I'm not going to cover it here. Uh, so I, I think I'm just going to really skip past this. Um, so I, I really don't want you to spend a lot of time uh, thinking, you know, trying to master this. What I want you to do is just... Just expose yourself to it. Let, let sort of the reality of this wash over you. So if at some point in your life, your boss asks you if you want to join the mathematics group, um, then you can, uh, <laughs> you, can, uh, you, can, you can go back and look at these slides and decide if, you want to, if, if, you're, if you're excited about working at that level of detail uh, in the mathematical part. Uh, a lot of people would probably think twice about it but uh, obviously somebody's got to do it so uh, otherwise we're, we're you know we wouldn't have math code processors and things that, you know we, we wouldn't have a lot of things that we really need all the time and use all the time then most people don't really think about okay so um, that's pretty much that uh, so let me put my face back up here okay so uh, I think I'm gonna think I'm gonna stop there, um, and then we'll. Uh, so that that pretty much completes uh, unit four, um, and I'll start unit five on Monday, and uh, so have a great weekend, and we will see you on Monday.